Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with celebrated Kansas City jazz drummer John Kazillermoo. On the heels of a CD release party at the record bar for KC's saxophonist Steve Martin's album Vision, John opened up about his journey in music. It's a long one. Getting to Kansas City, his gigs, wisdom, and so much more. So please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Perfect, man. Hey, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Sure. Let's hop right in here. And, you know, I got to say, in the annals of Kansas City Jazz these days, you have to be one of the most respected percussionists in this town. I've seen you quite a bit perform. So talk to me a little bit about what is going on in this Kansas City Jazz jazz life that you have. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be part of that scene. Kind of what brought me to Kansas City. Well, kind of. That's really why it came was the music. Kansas City has inarguably one of the best jazz scenes in the world. It's a blessing to get to be here and part of that. Right now, it's a really good time for Kansas City jazz. This little era that we're in right now is particularly good as well. So, as for, uh, like, my reputation, I'm just going to knock on wood over here and try to keep doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> so, I saw you the other night at the record bar playing for Stephen Martin's record release party. You've been at the Green Lady. You, mm-hmm. you just, you, you make your rounds quite a bit here in Kansas City. So, are you playing every night of the week or pretty close? I'm actually trying to scale back a little bit from that. There's been a stretch here where I've been kind of playing every night for quite a while. You can love something seemingly, like, limitlessly and still kind of wish that you didn't have to do it every night <laughs> once sure. in a while. So I'm trying to be at home with my son a little bit more. I have a wonderful 10-year-old. He just turned 10 on October 2nd. His name is Evan, and uh, he is uh, very worth all the time I could invest in. In fact, I'm taking the night off tonight. Um, we're hanging out. So it's great to be working every night, though, uh, or or most nights. Uh, you know, a big part of the credit for that goes to all the different venues that are supporting live music in Kansas City, like the record bar that you saw me at last weekend. It's really cool that they host uh, uh, Jeff Harshbarger and let him put on that series. Without those places, you know, you can practice all you want. <laughs> yeah. You know, put a band together, all that sort of thing, without a without a venue that will support you. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You can't make a living without the venues. So uh, I'm really grateful for all those different places that support jazz here in Kansas City. So if somebody wanted to go out and get a CD, a relatively recent CD of a project that you're on, Tell me which one they could pick up. Well, Stephen's project, the the Stephen Martin Quartet, um, his record Vision, was a lot of fun. Uh, we just wrapped that up. Um, I think we finished recording in May, and it might have been June. But anyway, that record just you know just got released uh, officially. Uh, the CD release party was uh, Sunday, so uh, I'm really proud of that one. That's Matt Villinger on piano. And uh, Carl McComas Reichel on bass. Uh, it's a real special quartet. We put a lot of effort into the music, and uh, I feel like you can hear it on there. So that's a good one. Um, previous to that, let's see. Uh, I actually have a, a salsa group that is not really Kansas City affiliated, but I've been part of it for a long time. Uh, it's called Barranderos Latin Combo. P A R R A N D E R O S. Barranderos. And we put out a record in 2014 uh, that we recorded in San Juan at uh, Playbox Studios, which is a really great, uh, it's a very special place to get to make a record. We actually had to audition to record there. And that's a self-titled record. I'm really proud of that one, too. So those are two records that are uh, brand new that, or relatively new that uh, I was lucky to take part in. So you said that at the beginning of the interview that you had come to Kansas City. So talk to me about 
where you grew up and kind of how you made your way to Kansas City. I was born in Chicago, another city with a really great jazz scene. I was a little too young to know about it at the time. We moved to Michigan. I lived in Detroit and the surrounding suburbs. Kind of grew up in that area. And uh, then I went to high school in Des Moines, Iowa. And then uh, I went to college a few years ago at Northwest Missouri State University in Maryville. Uh, go Bearcats. <laughs> <laughs> I moved to Austin and uh, got my master's degree at the University of Texas uh, and lived in Austin for a long time. Loved living there at that time. And then I did some teaching uh, and ended up back in Des Moines at Drake University. And that's where I was before I came to Kansas City. But I, I was having this experience while I was teaching at Drake. Uh, it was a good job, and I had some really great students. And that's a pretty good school. I should have been satisfied, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to have a good job. And uh, I just kept waking up in the middle of the night thinking, um, I haven't ever been just a musician. And that's, that's what I've always wanted to be. And I, you know, heard this voice saying, you're about to have not done it. And so I had to take a big risk and leave that job and move to a, a jazz city and uh, see what it's like. And it's been, uh, I think it's been six years. It's been five years and some change, I know. Uh, I'm just going to keep doing it until it stops working. Cool. So what jazz albums did you listen to growing up that really left a mark on you? This is an interesting story about discovering jazz because nowadays it's really... You know, you have no excuse to, but to find the right recordings and everything. But back in when I was a kid, you know, we didn't, there's no internet, there's no any of that stuff, and it's all just kind of word of mouth. So I had wanted to check out this Pat Metini recording that I heard about, and so I went to I think I went to Best Buy or one of those stores that that used to you know be the places to get recordings. And when I get there, I couldn't remember. Pat's name. I just knew, uh, like, I knew it was Pat something, and uh, and that he played guitar. And so I tried to find this Pat Metheny record. I was, I, I was looking for Still Life Talking was the record I was looking for, but uh, I ended up taking home this other recording and I put it on. I was like, I feel like this is not what I was looking for, and it was a Pat Benatar record. <laughs> So that's the first jazz recording I bought was uh, <laughs> Pat Benatar. And no no offense to Pat Benatar. She's great, I'm sure. It just was not really uh, what I was looking for. Uh, and after that, I kind of just borrowed records from from teachers and friends. There were a couple of records I can remember, like, really falling in love with and listening to over and over and over and over. One of them was this Matheny record, uh, 8081 with Dewey Redman and Jack DeJanet and uh, Charlie Hayden, I think, was playing, was playing bass on that. Uh, and I think that Mike Brecker is on it, as well as Dewey Redman. I think that, you know, I can remember where I was the first time I, I listened to that record, and uh, I probably listened to it, you know, maybe a thousand times or something. Uh, it really had an impact on me. And I, I kind of branched out from that record. It's not really the most common place to start, you know, listening to jazz. A lot of people get into the music through records like Kind of Blue or, or something like that, and I, I didn't really discover that record right away. Plus, as a kid, I was not the kind of person that would, you know, if you said, you should listen to this record, I would, like, I would say in my head, I would be like, well, that, that means I'm never going to listen to it because you told me to do it. Yeah. Was the, I kind of was like, was an early hipster, I guess, or something. I don't know. So it took a minute before I I got into classic recordings. Another record that was real heavy for me was this Tony Williams record called Lifetime. And I still remember where I was when I heard that for the first time. I had an uncle that played drums, and he put this record on. And uh, the first two we listened to was Fred. And it starts out with this... Uh, I mean, all you know, all Tony's doing is is crashing cymbals for a second. There's something about the way that he did it that I was just like, oh my gosh, I got to hear everything that this guy's ever played. It just really impacted me a lot. So that's a great recording. And then there's another, like, kind of maybe not that common of a record that I ran into 
I brought, I got it from the library. Uh, I was looking for a Winton record uh, because I knew Winton Marsalis was. I mean, this this is this would have been like uh, maybe 1992 or 93. So Winton, you know, was like he wasn't new on the scene, but he was, you know, it was around the big, you know, the time where he had really started making this huge impact and was in the media and everything. The only Winton record. That they had at the library was this record called Majesty of the Blues. I didn't know anything about it, and I took it home and uh, I had these giant headphones that I got at a garage sale. I put it on my TV player and uh, popped on the headphones and uh, immediately fell asleep listening <laughs> 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 to it uh, because it, it's like uh, I mean I was a kid in high school and it's this really esoteric. And very spiritual, but also very complex settings of like New Orleans funeral marches. It's really melancholy and uh, kind of a little overwhelming in a way. I'm kind of, you know, asleep listening to this record. And the second to last track on the record is uh, kind of a it's kind of a sermon about Ellington. I can't remember the name of the preacher, but it's a, it's a like pretty well known Baptist preacher I had some connection to Winton and uh it's like maybe fifteen minutes or something. This guy gives a sermon about, about jazz and Ellington. And it turns out that that record, uh, if I remember right, came out as a response to Time magazine putting out a cover, you know, the, the Time magazine cover was a an obituary for jazz. And Winton put this record out as a response, if I remember right. So you know, there's this sermon where, like, the guy gets more and more fired up and he's, like, talking about how, you know, Ellington and his band would sleep in barns and all, you know, all that stuff that, that we know about his music. I didn't know about it yet. Uh, and I'm just learning about it. You know, I kind of woke up to the guy's voice and I'm, like, in the perfect state of mind. You know, like, I just blissfully dozed away to some New Orleans funeral march music and then I'm like gently awakened by <laughs> this voice that uh, is now programming me to like understand Duke Ellington and uh, by the time you know he's at the end of that that sermon I'm like all fired up and ready to go like okay I gotta listen to more music and I wanna learn more about this music and right when he finishes uh, Herlin Riley, this like legendary New Orleans drummer, comes in like right as the the Reverend finishes uh, and drops this second line beat, which is the first time I'd ever heard second line play on the drums. And Herlin is like inarguably one of the best alive at, at playing that beat. And so, he, you know, as soon as he started playing that second line beat, I was like, okay, I found a career. <laughs> it was like kind of over at that point. There was no way I was not pursuing jazz music. That record was big for me. I I wouldn't necessarily say that it, it was like you know a pillar of the the annals of recording history in, in jazz music or anything. It's a great record, but it was the right record for me at the right time. So I really dug that one. You know, it's interesting. I'm reading Nate Shannon's book on playing changes, talking about kind of the newer evolution of jazz and where it's going, which is a real glowing retrospective of jazz today. And they were talking about that Grammy year that Michael Jackson threw the hat and came out with the glove and everybody went crazy. That was the mm -hmm. first time, I mean, just imagine this, that when Mark Solis was on stage and really introduced himself to the world. You know, everybody yeah. took a side seat that night because MJ was such a big deal. But mm -hmm. when Whitten came out, he was kind of doing that thing where he was like, not only is jazz not dead, it's alive in a way that I'm going to bring it back, you know. And that was kind of, you think about the Marsalis dynasty as this thing where they're trying to stay crystallized in this historic notion, but it was really him rebuffing that Time article and really saying, look, jazz has always been an evolutionary thing, and you make a mistake when you define it or tell people what it is, because this is what it is, and it's cool. It's kind of been his mantra, I think. I mean, I think that um, the bones of the music are uh, made of, like, undefined material. That's the whole That's the whole thing. I mean, you know, there's that thing with Canal Street, 
uh, in New Orleans where you have these people, all these people from these different cultures that would get together and, and play music together. What kind of music was that that they were making? You know, you have people from yeah. Europe and Africa and all, you know, all these different places. That's a, that's an undefined, you know, that music doesn't even have a name yet. You know, that's the, that music was the, the seed that would become jazz, but I mean, it, so the idea of trying to define what jazz music is, that to me is like, that itself is perpendicular to what the music is made of. Let me ask you this. You know, when I watch you perform live, I see the technique, I see the formal training. You're an educator, you've been educated, but I also see a good level of visceral uh, vicissitude, or however you want to put it, that's going into what sure. you do. Talk to me about how you approach the kit and how you have evolved from the beginnings of taking on the drum kit to where you're at today. Uh, thanks, by the way. Um, a big part of, I guess, my sound and everything is the uh, the classical training that, that I've been through. I have a master's degree from the University of Texas, and I've had some really wonderful teachers. really fell in love with playing timpani and the marimba and orchestral percussion instruments. And at, at one point, I was doing the the... I started doing the orchestral audition circuit for a minute, trying to find a regional orchestra position, um, and had planned to do that kind of as a day job, and then try and play uh, as much jazz as I could at night. So, uh, all that that time spent, you know, studying or- orchestral excerpts and uh, that kind of music, that all is a big part of uh, what I was happening on the drums. Uh, I didn't plan that at all. I didn't, like, really, when I was practicing timpani, I wasn't thinking, this will help me to play the right cymbal. Uh, it, it is all connected. It's all the same, you know, music is music. But uh, uh, I think that's a that's a big part of the actual acoustic sound you're hearing is classical training. So the, the, the other side, you know, I feel like my favorite experiences in music are when I forget to think, listening to music. You know, uh, the first time I saw uh, Arts and Crafts, Matt Wilson's band, uh, they came to the University of Texas and put on a little clinic in the in the room where we rehearsed the jazz ensembles. They were so captivating and so spontaneous, and there was just so much joy and everything that uh, I. I had this experience uh, when they finished playing the first song. I had this experience that I was like, hey, I forgot to think about anything while they were playing. You know, in the middle of grad school, you have a really analytical mind, and you tend to look at everything through a, a dissecting microscope. And um, this was the opposite of that. You know, it was this, like, I just was present and experienced the music, and I... Um, I try to do that now as a as a musician. I try to be present in the music and not outside of it. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I was I was telling this story uh, to a friend of mine yesterday. I had a little rough patch last year, uh, and I was kind of down for a, a minute. Uh, and we had these Saturday night gigs with with the Stephen Martin Quartet, and I'd had a had a pretty rough Saturday and was just really not in a great headspace to play music. I got there and I kind of like just tried to live inside of the music, like the way that like Luke Skywalker slept in the tauntaun, <laughs> like yeah. in Star Wars, you know, where you just like cut the music open and climb inside of it and then just like. Uh, try not to look outside until it's over. That metaphor is like a, that's a pretty good metaphor for what it feels like to play music. I feel like, um, you can, if you're, if you're good at getting the right mindset, you can exist, your consciousness exists only inside of the music. And, uh, it's a really, you know, it's, it's like a very meditative experience for me as a musician. Uh, and also, it seems to help me to play my best, too. Perfect. So let me ask you this. You've had the chance to play with names like Aretha Franklin, Doc Severinsen, Matt Wilson, Jimmy Heath, Branford Marsalis, Logan Richardson. My question is this. 
What do you mm-hmm. learn from these people, like legends and up-and-comers and luminaries and very veteran seasoned souls that have done this for a while? What do you learn from them? I mean, there's so much that you can learn from any one of those people. And, uh, like, I mean, first of all, when you you know you read that list, I'm like, how did that happen? <laughs> that's, that's a crazy list. I like still look for my keys and wallet every day. Like I don't know how I I got so lucky to have that. But uh, you know, for example, like uh, since she just passed away, let's talk about uh, let's talk about Aretha Franklin. She needed a percussionist, not a drum set player, uh, for a gig on the Fourth of July up in Iowa. We get up there. And she wanted to do a rehearsal the day before and a concert on the 4th. So we're up there on the 3rd, and uh, something had happened with her drummer, and he couldn't make the rehearsal on the 3rd. Like, he had missed a flight or missed a connection or something. I ended up getting to play drums in her band <laughs> that day. And it was, a, it was a great opportunity and a really difficult challenge and uh, the perfect time in my life for it to happen because I I felt like I was in a place where I was up for the challenge. So uh, the band, you know, her band, her musical director and everything, there was some kind of miscommunication and they thought that I was, the, the concert was in Sioux City, Iowa. And so they thought I was like a local resident of Sioux City, Iowa uh, and probably not anywhere near capable of playing that show. And so there was a, like a there was like a real intense negative vibe about me playing drums in the rehearsal. They just were stuck though. They didn't. There was no choice. They didn't have anybody else. Uh, and so uh, I had this opportunity to like receive that that vote of no confidence and to like smile back at everybody and be like, "You'll see." And then we got to do this rehearsal. And at the end of the rehearsal, the music director comes up to me. I guess Aretha had been listening on the phone from her spaceship or wherever she stayed. You know, like, uh, that's a story in itself. But anyway, she says, if Ron can't make it tomorrow, you got the gig. I was really honored to have had that opportunity and to have done well enough that uh, it worked out that way. And I'm also really glad that he was there the next day because playing the percussion book is lots of fun, super enjoyable, and low pressure. Actually playing drums in her band uh, in front of 50,000 people or however many, I mean, there was like 45-something thousand people in the audience that day. That would have not been as much fun. That would have been a lot of pressure and a very high-stress gig. Uh, And so I got to experience the best of both worlds. So those are the kind of learning experiences that you can have when you have those you get those opportunities. I will say that, like, I tried to approach listening to her for the first time, you know, like, in person for the first time. I tried to hear her voice cynically and not, like, all, like, starstruck and and in fanboy mode. Because I wanted to really know, like, was she really as good as everybody thinks that she is? And I can tell you from having sat, you know, about six feet away from her, that I can't imagine how anyone could have possibly done a better job. Her voice and performance, everybody's right about her. She was the queen of soul. There's things like that that you can learn that are are really special. Absolutely. So up to this point in your life and your career, are you happy with how everything's turned out? I am so much more than happy about it. (laughs) I keep waiting for uh, reality to, to come and smashing down. Uh, I don't, but the truth is, like, uh, this is the reality, and I feel really lucky and honored to have had, you know, to have had all these opportunities and to be able to make a living playing this music. Uh, I have a nice, comfortable home in Kansas City and, uh, uh, a car to drive around and, and all these things that, you know, uh, supposedly if you pick music, you know, especially if you pick jazz, uh, you're destined for, you know, crushing poverty and a lifetime of struggle. And that's certainly how it was for all the people I grew up listening to in many ways. Uh, and 
I feel incredibly lucky that that's not necessarily the case for me. I'm I'm here, you know, uh, in my kitchen making coffee in the morning and, and driving my car around and I, I don't know, just so many things that uh, it's so much easier in this generation than it was for all the luminaries. And some of that uh, is also uh, the privilege of being white as well. And I don't want to leave that part out. We don't have to get too much into that, but that's making it easier for me too. Uh, and I wish it wasn't that way, but it's something that should be mentioned every at every opportunity and never pass on. So, and so yeah, I feel I'm so much more lucky than I would have deserved. And I mean, I know that I've worked hard too, but I'm just trying to celebrate it and keep doing this as long as I can. You've been a part of big shows. You played a lot of live music. So let's reverse the table here. What shows, jazz shows, have you seen in the crowd that really left an impact on you? Oh, man, that's a great question. Uh, I was hoping we can get into this. So this is another reason uh, why it's great to live here in KC. We're kind of a hub uh, in the Midwest for the music. A couple years ago, no, it was just last year, maybe, uh, Logan came to the Blue Room uh, with uh, a really super fantastic band. Um, and uh, I had one of these experiences where, like, uh, and I'm sure, you know, everybody listening, we all have this kind of experience from time to time uh, when you uh, watch someone do what you're doing, uh, and they do it so well that you either have to stop doing it or evolve. And Logan's show was like that for me. It was so powerful and, and such a, like, it was just such an incredible performance uh, from the whole band that I I felt this sense of, like, I didn't have to stop playing music or evolve from this experience. I kind of made a list of, of the things that I heard that had affected me so much, and that became the list of things that I was working on. And I'm still working on all those things. So that was a great show. That was at the Blue Room, 18 Divine Jazz Festival. Last, you know, not this last summer, but the summer before. Bobby Watson's group with Victor Lewis on drums. Uh, I'd always wanted to, I'd always wanted to see Victor Lewis. I'd never seen him play live before, and it was real special to get to see him. Even though Bobby lives here in KC, I don't get to see him play that much. So it was great to hear. Him and like I got, I got such a kick out of seeing the other side of him. It's mostly when we run into each other. It's either uh, he's just popped in to say hello at a gig, you know, to UMKC grads or something, or like he's more kind of in in uh, hello, how you're doing, how are you doing mode more than like uh, Bobby Watson who played with the Messengers. He's a beast of <laughs> a musician, yeah. and it was really great to see him do his thing last summer. I'm glad I got the chance. And then, you know, another great example of what's going on, uh, a friend of mine came to visit, uh, Bob Washett, that uh, was a long, for a long time was the director of jazz studies at the University of Northern Iowa. He's a great musician and arranger in his own right. Uh, and he just retired. And so they were traveling through Kansas City. We went out to the Majestic uh, and caught, uh, let's see, uh, it was Ryan Lee on drums, Andrew Stinson on bass, and Peter Slam was playing piano. Watching that music, you know, watching that trio affect Bob the way that it did, Bob was just like, uh, he's like, you gotta be kidding me. This is like, what happens at dinner time? You know, it's at, in Kansas, this is like the dinner music. He's like, this is incredible. And he was blown away, especially by Peter's piano playing, uh, and rightfully so. So, you know, it's easy for us to take that for granted when we live here, but there's so much profound and wonderful and deep music happening every night of the week in Kansas City. You know, it's nice to see the effect on it, of it on a great musician from out of town. Uh, it can wake it can wake you up to how good it is. So why do you love jazz? I'm not really sure, you know. It's a, it's a good question because as a kid, uh, I got into playing music 
because of John Bonham and Led Zeppelin. That was the, you know, that's what I was trying to do. And I still love that music. I still listen to particularly that band quite a bit. But something about that music connected with me. And I don't remember saying, like, I like jazz now. You know, it kind of was like on a deeper level than that. I just had a good experience listening to the music and, and playing it in school. Although, like, playing the music in school didn't have much to do with me liking the music. We were not, I don't know that we were a very good high school jazz band at that time, but, you know, there was a band that, uh, uh, I saw in Des Moines when I was in high school. Uh, her name is Janie Hooper. She passed away a few years ago. She's a really incredible singer. And she had a gig at this place called Mel's in Des Moines. Uh, and her band played jazz and, and R&B. And uh, she had a really great, you know, it was like the best musicians in the city all were lining up to play with Janie. So she had this great band. Uh, I used to go into Mel's with my friend Jason, and we weren't old enough to get in there, but uh, Mel would, like, lead us to a table and let us just kind of sit there and watch the band, uh, which was really cool of him. But I remember thinking, watching that band, that I was like, this is, I'm trying to get into this. And I really, really wanted to go and sit in with that band, but I knew as a high school kid, I was like, I'm not qualified to do that. I would just make, I would humiliate myself if I tried. So, uh, it filled me with this, like, motivation to try and get in a place <coughs> where I could play that music well enough to sit in with a band like that. So, that probably was a big part of it, too. So, everything's going to funnel down to this. Everyone has a perception of you. They have this notion mm-hmm. of who they think you are. Your family, your friends, your fans. But you know John best. Who do you think you are? Oh, man, I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> it is not time. I don't think I know who I am. And the pieces are still assembling. And I'll let you know when I figure it out. For the time being, I mean, I know part of who I am is uh, uh, playing this music. And part of it's being a father and part of it is this and part of it is that, so uh, I'm just going to try and do the individual parts as well as I can. Maybe the pieces will assemble uh, when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's great, man. That's yeah. a great answer. I like it. Okay. John, yeah. thank you for taking some time out to open up about your life in Kansas City Jazz, your history and music. It's been an honor. I appreciate it. Well, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Kansas City and spots all over the globe giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to John for his talent, his time, and his music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. <laughs>